I guess that's our cue. Uh, welcome back, everybody. Uh, my name is John Guerin. I'm faculty member at Nova Southeastern University, Shepherd Broad College of Law in Fort Lauderdale, Florida. And <clears throat> if we hadn't had enough, we get another hour of more generative AI. So welcome to a brand new topic. It's always fun to go 27th on the same topic. Uh, but hopefully, I'll talk about a couple things we haven't heard. Um, and then probably give different answers to a couple things we've already heard, and hopefully that will fuel some Q&A. Uh, this slide is built on yet another AI tool. This is called Beautiful AI, which is a, uh, a PowerPoint AI generator, and it has an AI that will write your entire slide deck for you uh, very poorly at this point. But again, all these tools are getting better over time. Uh, but great copyright-free images. If we want to get into the weeds a little bit about the copyright issue, I'm happy to do that uh, as well. So in the few minutes that we have for this part of the talk, originally I'm going to talk a little bit about generative AI. I'm probably, given the great presentation that we had as the keynote, I'm going to truncate that a lot. Um, I am going to spend a couple more minutes on the uses of the technology. We haven't really explored that in detail yet. Consequences to the legal field. I am a former uh, two-time dean, and so looking at the implications of this technology in the law school and in the profession is something that I think we need to pay some attention to. And then, of course, as has been heavily discussed in the online literature, there's a lot of concerns that we have about uh, bias, community standards, dangerous advice that the AI is generating, um, inconsistency in access, and just a host of social consequences. Again, that were alluded to briefly in the keynote that we'll talk about. And then finally, get back to the question uh, that the panel just before us spent about 10 minutes on, Rebecca Rich tipped up, which is how do we incorporate this appropriately into legal education. Um, and I'm probably going to rush through a couple things so we can spend more time on some additional thoughts about that. Um, so with that, we will try and move forward. There we go. Um, again, I'm not going to explain what generative AI is other than to distinguish it between other forms of AI because it generates narrative or visual output, right? And so the AI that we've been using for 20 years in our GPS, in our phones to navigate maps is of a different nature because it gives us information, but it doesn't generate this content. And that conceptually, as we saw when ChatGPT3 was announced uh, in no just in November, right, has really hit a different uh, tone with the public, right? Um, it was not actually considered to be a major innovation by the company, uh, and yet it just exploded as people realized uh, what it's being done. It's not just generating text. Um, we've seen the audio development uh, that was demonstrated in the prior uh, program. It has also been used to generate entirely new musical works. Um, so there is a uh, album out of famous uh, dead performers, uh, Janis Joplin um, uh, and others, Amy Winehouse and others, right, where it generated new fake versions of their music uh, as if they were still alive and able to write today been very powerful. It's used for live artists. It was posted on Spotify. Warner Music told Spotify, take it down or our entire library goes. Spotify backed off and has removed uh, that content, right? So there's major collisions, as was alluded to this morning, between the creative industries. Uh, the Writers Guild, of course, is on strike over the issue right now. The music industry is really struggling with the ability to create Right. an infinite number of nearly good enough content and what that does, the economic models underlying uh, the creative industry. Right. In the area that I'm actually most excited for is product design. 
iter and I don't have slides on this in the instance of time, but iterative product design is already allowing generative AI to do thousands of virtual prototypes of a product and reduce the <coughs> manufacturing cost where weight matters, reduce the physical weight of products to come up with designs that we would never think about. We saw that protein fold example uh, this morning and the ideas that it can generate in the product field are truly unlimited. And so we're already seeing significant use uh, in that field as well. So it has potential in healthcare, finance, education, manufacturing, of course, law, entertainment, and every other field of endeavor. It really is an inflection point um, that is really hard to kind of calculate. Just a quick sense of how fast we have grown, right? It took three and a half years for Netflix to get one million users. It took ChatGPT five days, right? So the public's attention has been captured to this technology in a way that we have never seen in modern human history, right? This is going back to the electric light bulb and just fundamental changes. On the other side here, we see some of the various models that have been described in the previous programs. Uh, ChatGPT4, you can see here in the orange, right, is actually not the largest model. And the Google uh, Glam model is actually bigger. Uh, they also have UPalm and the like. So we see that there are, and scale in this is uh, tens of billions of parameters of the data that's being used to train the model. Since this graphic was published a week ago, um, Intel has announced a new chip. Currently, NVIDIA is the leader of GPUs, graphical processing units that create the hardware to run this very expensive to operate software. Uh, Intel has just announced a new uh, chip and model. The chip they claim runs 30% faster than the NVIDIA chip and the training model was on one trillion parameters. So five to, five to six times the size of ChatGPT4. Right? So the scale, the logarithmic scale of growth continues to explode. Meta tried to get into the business, released some of its code, the people it released its code to, uh, republished it in the wild. And so now there are LLM models that are no longer under corporate control at all. Meta is being fined in Europe for creating what is essentially an existential threat to the, the uh, reality. Um, but it also is acknowledged that there's no way of it getting its code back. And so there are hundreds and hundreds of companies who are developing new tools, new tricks, um, trying to break it uh, simply because they can. And so it is out there, uh, for better or worse. All right, so I've talked a little bit about the different process. You here see some of the different uh, imagery. Again, we've had earlier presentation on the imagery, so I'm going to skip forward. The slides are being particularly annoying. Um, so what are the benefits, right? Again, I think we heard, usually when I give this talk, people are more dour than excited. The previous panel, two panels have been pretty excited, so I can go quickly to the benefits. Um, if you know what you're writing, the efficiency of drafting is pretty phenomenal, right? So you know basically how to write what you want to write. You throw the stuff in. It sounds good. It writes in the format that you want. Um, great, as we saw, research, e-discovery <coughs> is going to really transform e-discovery. Um, so if you're a plaintiff's lawyer, you are really deeply excited about finding more smoking guns. Um, algorithms to assist with anti-discrimination. I think one thing that we have underexplored is legal informatics and the potential for this to really create this not just as an idiosyncratic hobby, but as a meaningful enterprise where we look at the distribution of justice and rights in a systematic way and be able to capture that data through AI in a way that we haven't before and then match whether the outcomes of our laws and the intent of our laws track. I think there's an entire field that can be developed in this space and I really hope that we spend some time on it. Legal clinics and pro se clinics 
not pro se clients, I'll keep reinforcing this notion, but under the supervision of lawyers and law students, these tools can magnify the resources that those lawyers have to provide legal services and further democratize the tremendously unmet legal need. 80 to 85% of all legal services go unmet. And so it's a huge tool in that space, but it is just handing a loaded gun to pro se uh, parties. And so just don't do that because it's bad. Um, and we'll talk more about why that. First drafts, plain language writing. So take what you wrote and give it whatever you wrote and ask it to make sure this was written in plain language and simplify your writing. It's a great tool editor. And it's already there. As an editor, it already uh, is cooked enough um, as opposed to a generator where it's still a dangerous thing. Um, I've talked about legal informatics a little bit. It is being used and has been actually used for a few years. Starting in the patent space, um, informatics companies had tracked every single, starting with uh, the, the Federal Circuit and then the uh, TTAB and then on to the district court judges. Every opinion in the patent space, and we're moving into most civil litigation, every argument that each judge finds appealing or unappealing. So sophisticated law firms, those with the largest uh, financial support, can run a judge's prior opinions against their database of possible arguments to find out the winners and the losers and the ones that make the judge mad and really start to micromanage at a you know, judge level. Now, whether or not that's justice is a different question. I have some kind of ethical concerns about the fact that we're pick, picking our arguments based on what the judge likes. But nonetheless, we do it already. This quantifies it, and it's been very effective in the patent space. It's now part of the standard practice in high stakes jury trials. Um, and again, it's changing. It's, it, it is eliminating that knowledgeable, sophisticated, bespoke lawyer and turning it all into data management science. Simple as that. Um, and then, of course, it's creating an entire new field for lawyers who are trained in informatics um, and cyber. Uh, so it's a new. It's a yet a new field for us to teach for our students. So it'll keep us busy. Right. So what are the threats? Well, first, as we know, hallucinations. Right? It's a lovely word for it's batshit crazy wrong. Okay? <laughs> That's a defined term, by the way. So you're <laughs> um, it's highly inaccurate. It fabricates content. It, if you ask something about yourself while you are in the news as a faculty member, it'll most likely associate your name with some claim of sexual harassment. Um, <laughs> not about you, but about someone you know. Jean Volokh from UCLA did this experiment, um, and it just made up facts about a research assistant who had been involved in an altercation and his failure to discipline the student. It just went on and on, making up absolutely unfactual information. Uh, uh, Eugene describes it as a defamation engine, right? And so we have a, there's a journal of free speech that has, I think, 20 of us have written articles on different aspects of defamation um, and AI. But it, because it isn't bound by factual information, it's highly dangerous when it provides facts about individuals. Um, the training models are not proprietary. And so what that means is and we've seen already multiple instances of this, right? All AI, uh, generative AI is banned at Apple, for example. Apple has banned generative AI because engineers were putting code in to Copilot, which is a tool that came out of OpenAI, <coughs> operated by Microsoft, it's part of their partnership, and it does a wonderful job of finding bugs in code, of annotating code, streamlining code, and sharing code within the data set. If you are a company that likes patents, if you're a company that has proprietary information, you just gave away the keys to your castle when you uploaded your software. Because now it's public data. It can never be used again for your patents. And so it's been banned at most companies that have patent portfolios. Uh, Apple's the most recent and most obvious of companies uh, to do so. Same thing in the law firm. Right? You represent a company that's about to go public. 
and you ask a question about, say, the target, the, the company that's going public, or the target in a merger, right? you are now sharing information into the data set that may trigger a securities violation, trade secret infringement, or the like. Right? So the fact that it's essentially a public database creates a host of ethical and legal limitations on its use. Now we're going to be at the point, probably within 12 to 24 months, where the largest law firms in the country all have proprietary in-house LLMs, and they can then upload their own forms, files, and client data into that closed box, and they are protected from these concerns. So it's coming in a bigger way, and our students, as we talked about a few minutes ago, have to understand how to use these tools properly. But the first thing is, there's a big difference between the open box and the closed box. And if you don't understand that, you're in big trouble. It reminds me of the student who, her first day of work at Skadden, was starting to, went on Facebook and started to write about the big project she was allowed to work on. And thankfully, a, someone saw her about to write in the name of the client that was about to go public the next day and caught her. Uh, before she posted that and destroyed a multi-million dollar merger. Um, but her dean was called, right? I know the story to be true. Um, her dean was called and the firm said, look, we'll never take another student again unless you train them on social media and what privacy really means. Has anybody trained their students yet on privacy and AI? Show of hands. Okay, we got two. That's it. Okay. It is being used by, according to the studies, 80% of students who admit it thus far. Okay. So four to five students are using it. Two out of 150 schools who are here have actually talked about the fact that there's a privacy issue involved underlying some of this data. Um, misapplication of AI violates PR rules. We'll talk about that in a minute. Um, and then again, the availability of AI is not going to be evenly distributed. The cost of running these models, there's a reason that OpenAI took a billion dollars from Microsoft, because the processing power is extraordinarily expensive. Each chip, NVIDIA chip, that's a GPU costs $10,000. This is not throw it on a laptop. The scale of these systems are such that only the most expensive resources uh, can be dedicated to them. And if we talk about distributed justice, access, fairness, and equity, right, this price barrier is going to change or exacerbate societal divisions in ways that, again, even though we keep saying it, I think are still underappreciated. One of the things that we learned just in the last month, uh, the ABA reported, that in fact over 50% of the legal revenue earned by law firms is in the top, I think it was 20 firms, most of it in the top five firms. So we, no longer, we think about law as being an unconsolidated industry, but in fact the revenues, that's no longer the case. We are a highly consolidated revenue generating industry, again with that 85% unmet legal need, and these tools, because of their infrastructure, are going to exacerbate rather than flatten that uh, problem. So it's something to worry about. I also have existential concerns. Right? Those are the practical. The existential, uh, first, uh, the disinformation, IP violations. Right? Overall, is this like social media? And in fact, its net value, uh, its harms outweigh its benefits. The internet of 2005 and the world we lived in, I think if we take a step back and think about it, was probably a better place than the internet and world we live in today. And yet we allowed social media to flourish as if, as if it was inevitable rather than a corporate choice. We're at that same inflection point today, and most of the corporations who are pushing these products are telling us, oh, it's too late. We've made this decision, right? We're done. Ask yourself whether we really want to be in this world. Um, already, in the first quarter, 23, the one we just ended, 5% employment reduction across industry, this is not law, across industry, has already been tied to generative AI. 
the category wasn't in the report in the fourth quarter of 22. So these are not theoretical job losses. And yes, we will have jobs for new things in the future. But you know, again, working in the, uh, the media and entertainment industries, the music industry dropped in size by over 50% between 1999 with the introduction of Napster and 2010 when streaming started to change and create an entirely different business model. Right? Over a 50% reduction in jobs as well as revenue. So it has real world implications. Anecdotally, I've seen communications among law firms already that suggest their entering classes are going to be between 5 and 20% smaller for the next year because of the efficiencies that these tools can generate. So those are just emails that have been shared among partners um, and shared with some of the technology committees of the ADA. Again, it's very informal, but it suggests that if people think these tools are efficient and will replace hiring, then people won't hire. Whether they're right or wrong, <coughs> that's going to change the decision making um, already, even though these project may or may not work. Then we get into the conversation that we started at the end of the last presentation, that this, in a, or in the pan, first panel, that the inefficient work of lawyers, if we just eliminate all of that, what we actually eliminate is a lot of the gateway work. Right? Now, I'm not suggesting that document review is one of those categories. I think you, anyone who's been in that room knows that the, only, that the smart lawyer was the one who figured out to get out of that room as fast as possible. Right? But there's a tremendous amount of grunt work that we all cut our teeth on to learn how to go from being a novice attorney to a sophisticated attorney. And if we automate all that work, then there's no, uh, we used to call it bridging the gap. Right? There's no longer a bridge in the chasm. And there's no way to take a law student and turn them into a bespoke uh, consigneri for a law firm if they don't have work to do in between. So we have to think about maintaining those bridges. All right. Um, again, these threats aren't new, right? So if you think back in history, gunpowder redefined European military and consolidated the power of the modern state. Automobiles led to the suburbs. Automobiles along with the pill led to the women's movement. Right? Uh, motion picture industry was the fifth largest industry in the United States by 1916, with 10 years before there were talking motion pictures. Right? So we've gone through this before. It's not like the world's going to end. I actually don't think that the AI is going to kill us all. But I do think it's going to radically change the winners and losers. Um, so. So I'm going to skip PR in the interest of t time. Am I OK? Or I lost myself some time. Oh, yeah, I've got about like 15, 20 minutes. Yeah, so yeah, you're running long. On OK, now. so AI, PR, right? we have to make our students technically competent, but rule 1.6. We have to make them understand client communications, so on and so forth. Lots of rules. Don't violate them. Teach our students they exist. <laughs> All right, there's the rules. All right, we have to teach core competency of digital literacy, right? If AI plus social media plus the Russians and everything else creates more and more disinformation, we have to become much better at teaching digital literacy as a core competency. Understanding that if Superman's cape is on the wrong side of the body, it's probably a fake image. And to teach people how to read visually as well as textually to understand true from false. Again, I've gone too long, so I want to talk about that. Um, so I'm going to skip that. So here's the final point, and this comes back to the topic that, again, Becca asked the previous panel. Should we use this or not in law school is simply the wrong question. The question is, what is it for this particular assessment that the student is obligated to demonstrate competence? If it is a research assignment, then having the AI do the research 
is circumventing that assessment. And so it's not appropriate. If, however, it is, and if it's a memory retrieval assignment, right, what did you learn from class, asking AI to substitute for that memory retrieval is not an appropriate assignment. But if it is to craft a thesis and write a paper or write a document for a client that is accurate and correct, and you're not focused on what's coming out of the student's head or the student's process, then it's entirely appropriate to let the student use all the tools available. We need to unbundle what we do and think about what we do in a much more incremental manner. And most specifically, we tend to use legal writing as a surrogate for what we actually are intending to teach, which is critical thinking. Legal writing is not critical thinking. It never was. It's a lazy tool to teach critical thinking. So instead, we need to break down what critical thinking is, which I suggest is verification skills, interpretive skills, and reasoning skills. We need to identify each of those three skills we need to teach them and assess them using formative as well as substantive assessment in modularized components. And by doing that, then we eliminate the particular concerns that our writing tools are uh, sloppy with the context of AI. So specifically, and this is where, I'm going where John went, um, but right for, there you are, for Cali, we need new self-directed competency-based modules of teaching logic and argument using simple first-year subject matter. Right? We need to teach basic logic again, which is something that kind of fell out of law school in the 70s and 80s. We need self-directed competency-based modules for informational literacy. Right? Real site, fake site, accurate, not accurate, opinion, right? same site, but this came from the opinion section of the newspaper rather than from the uh, news section of the newspaper. What is a newspaper? Our students don't know. <laughs> um, and then we need communal learnings on the verification, interpretation of skills that also include cognitive bias training, document interpretation, and we do that through group exercise and the like. Right? We expand the professional responsibility, which also includes professional identity. Um, we add core technological competence because it is an ABA requirement and because it's the place where our graduates can get in the most trouble in the practice of law and it's because if they can't keep up then they're going to be out of business in 10 years and so we have to teach them the basics right as well as the future pieces so we can use generative AI as the go to drive us to better legal education by thinking about legal education as its critical skills competency, or we can be swept away from it. But the time is last week because these changes are coming so fast. Elmer, I'm sorry I went over time. Thank you very much. We'll do questions uh, at the end, because probably you all got some. by title. So we're going to talk about Cali and AI added the welcoming our robotic something because eh, it's not going to be overlord. <laughs> and unless you like taking orders from your toaster. But then maybe there's, I think I saw that movie on Netflix. Um, I'm Elmer. I'm the director of technology for Cali, which is the Center for Computer Assisted Legal Instruction. Um, and now we're getting back to the computer part again. Yay, we've been making books lately. 
which is nice, <laughs> but books aren't computers, but that's okay. I mean, we put them online, so you have to kind of need a computer, but you can still get the print version. Some quick background. I'm going to just run through these really quick just to refresh people's memory, because I know there's new people here and stuff. And sometimes people are standing at the conference going, well, why is Kelly running this? So we're a nonprofit, 501c3. Uh, we're a membership consortium of law schools. And I'm willing to bet that everybody's law school is a member, because most of them are, and uh, incorporated in 1982. So we've been around for a very, very long time. I was very young when Cali was incorporated. Um, these are the things that we do, roughly. Um, lessons, books, the Cali Awards. We've got our own authoring platforms. Um, there was a great session on that this morning. Definitely check out the video on that. Um, we also do uh, A to J stuff, um, which I left off that slide, but you know, we do that somewhere. Yeah, I know. <laughs> so, so some of this stuff actually got covered this morning in Pablo's talk and, and in all these sort of subse subsequent talks. So if you've been sticking with the AI track, then a lot of this isn't new, which will let me get through it pretty quick and we can, we can get to, to some stuff. But the whole artificial intelligence thing, it's been around for a long time, right? It's actually like older than the web, because the web hasn't been around that long, right? Uh, you know, the web only goes back to the late 80s. Our, you know, artificial intelligence work was already a couple of decades old by that point, right? Um, expert systems, um, in a lot of ways, Cali lessons function like little mini expert systems, especially when we use branching to sort of, you know, guide students through the different uh, uh, things that they need to learn and, uh, and all those sorts of things. So expert systems have been around a long time. They've been used a lot in the legal space. Um, the, uh, there's a lot of, 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 of practice tools that are built around them. The, the key thing about expert systems, though, was, was you needed an expert, so you need to have an attorney typically sit down with a system, a programmer, and they had to work together to, do, to build those systems, and that didn't always work out so well. So, um, you know, that's, but that's a, that's a thing. And then neural networks, which is sort of the basis for the, uh, the large language models and the deep learning tools that are being built today, also go way back, right? We saw that this morning. And, um, and the, the neat thing about neural networks that I've found is I've been, because I, I know Pablo this morning talked about working on this for like the past few years and all that stuff. And like I've been really only diving into it there for about six months, let's say. So. <laughs> So I got some of that new, you know, sort of neophyte energy around some of this stuff. Um, so I don't know everything or, or possibly anything at all about some of this stuff. But some of the math and stuff behind neural networks is not, like, I get it, which I'm not really a math guy, but like I can look at it and I can go, okay, I can see where this goes. But the secret to like, the sort of secret sauce to like the large language models is modifying the math and building layers of stuff. Like you know when the, you know uh, you mentioned a, a model being trained with a, a you know a trillion parameters, right? So you know that's just like a giant pile of numbers, but all around like one single thing, right? So um, you know it's the it's the sort of like repetitive nature of getting to those all those parameters. Because they don't all fire up at once, right? It's sort of an iterative process. So when large language models are being built, they do uh, they go through layers of training, and the more layers you can train, the better the model gets. And um, and then that's where the part where people don't say, you know, people say, well, I, you know, we don't know how this works, but it works because they can't see stuff's happening so fast. It's hard to tell exactly what the variations on the math that the program's using um, as they're iterating through things. And there are a lot of large language models, as we saw in the, that previous slide. So one of the things that, you know, it's always interesting when, like, if you wait long enough, eventually technology will catch up with you, right? Uh, hopefully. I mean, not always. But I don't have a flying, where's my flying car? That's what... Although I've been assured by numerous people that the technology exists 
And it's the federal government that's stopping us from having flying cars. But I don't know, maybe, I don't know. But um, so, so there's a lot of work that has been going on. Um, you know, sometimes people talk about the AI winter when like sort of artificial intelligence kind of fell out of favor and, and it wasn't really, but people kept working through that, right? Um, so there's a lot of work that went on there. And they also, uh, and, and the other thing is, is it's, it's all about data, right? So lots and lots and lots of data. I mean, it wasn't until a few years ago that the internet got so big that, you know, people were like, wow, this is just a ton of stuff. And, um, you know, and, and the ability to sort of get at all of that data, um, you know, became uh, easier. So, you know, there's a lot of it. And then there's the hardware, hardware, hardware thing, right? I mean, the, um, and I've got, I've got a couple of pictures coming up in a bit. But, but it really is about the hardware, right? I mean, the, the, the capability of, you know, the, the, the capability of the video card how many people have like some sort of fancy gaming computer at your house? It's okay. <coughs> it might belong to your kids. You might say it belongs to your kids. Or even a PS5, right? The latest generations of gaming station, you know, gaming consoles. The, the video cards in those, you know, generally have, you know, power that matches or possibly surpasses that of like, m you know, really big supercomputers from, you know, 10 years ago, right? So, um, so when you harness a whole bunch of those together, those video cards, which are specially designed to, uh, you know, are specially designed to, you know, to sort of run lots of number crunching, because after all, that's what pixels are, right? For video, I mean, every spot in the screen is just a map point with a, you know, with a color, which is also rendered as a number. So they need to do a lot of that, and that's where sort of the crossover. They're really good at math. Um, and so, so as those have gotten better and more capable, um, it's been easier to build the giant-sized computers that folks need to, to do this, and maybe even the little ones, right? So, so this is, uh, this is the, uh, the Cali uh, Deep Learning <coughs> Workstation, um, which resides uh, next to my desk. And, um, but the thing is, is that, you know, we built this so that um, so that I could try out some stuff, in a, in a lo you know, locally, so that we didn't have to spend a fortune on, um, you know, if you go out to Amazon and you spec out an Amazon instance that's on par with this, it costs about two fifty a minute to run, and I've been running it a lot. I mean, I would have already stripped past the amount of money I spent on this um, in in uh, in Amazon bills. And John doesn't like our Amazon bills, so I couldn't do that. So, um, so we did a we did a one time uh, one time sort of thing. <coughs> but this is just a really big. Uh, it's essentially yes, it is a really big gaming computer, um, but um, but it runs Linux, and I have not run any games on it. Although, and and that's that's primarily because even though it's a big gaming computer, I have my own big gaming computer, so I don't. <laughs> I don't need to use the other one. Um, this one works just fine. But on the other hand, um, this picture popped up today in a YouTube video that <coughs> Microsoft and NVIDIA released. This is a shot of the racks of their latest supercomputers, <coughs> right? So this is all those latest NVIDIA chips that, that folks have been talking about you know, in a couple of the different sessions people have mentioned. That, and, and they're just like racks and racks and racks and racks and racks and racks and racks of them. And that's what it looks like. So um, I, of course, can't do what that can do in my house, but, you know, I can at least keep myself warm. So the, because that gets hot, by the way, right? So the, so the video card in there, um, you know, mostly when it's just idling, it's nice and quiet and cool and, and everything, that's fine. But I fired it up to actually build a model. That was going to um, that should have taken about uh, 44 hours to build on that particular on the video card that I have in there. Um, I was following the instructions from uh, from a journal article that somebody had written two years ago. It took them four days to build the same model on the video card that they had then. So I was already making up time. Um, the thing started running. It gets very loud because all the fans right get going, and then it gets really hot. The video card was running. 
around 75, 77 degrees Celsius. Look that up, it's a little warm. Um, the outside of the case was nice, <coughs> toasty, 96 degrees. And uh, after about 11 hours of that churning and fans running, the video card just said, up. Oh, no, no, it's too hot, I'm done, and it just stopped. And that was the end of that process. And so it was, a, it was an 11 hour experiment. Um, at 300 and, or at 235 watts of continuous drain for 11 hours, and I'll be sending John my electric bill. So, the, um, <laughs> but but I wanted to build that test bed so that I could try things like that, right? Because the the um, you know because of the expense of the cloud, um, you know I wanted to be able to maybe not build the model from scratch, but do things like fine tuning and embedding. Um, you know I've I've also done a thing where I you know, I embedded, which is essentially I, I, I fed all of the Elang Dell uh, uh, PDF versions of the Elang Dell books, right? There's 20 some titles of the regular case books. I, I, I embedded them in, uh, in, a, in a model. Um, and then I was able to essentially uh, do a kind, of, a kind of search inside this book on steroids sort of thing. Um, it, it, it worked okay because it would actually answer questions. It would actually answer legal questions based on the content of the Elang Dell books, but it didn't always get the sections right. It was like sort of a, I don't know, it was a little funky. So anyway, that's why there's not a live demo of that. But it could be better. Um, also, as a, a foreshadow of my session on tomorrow about, tomorrow about the Drupal 9 migration, um, it's also really handy to have that machine has 128 gigs of physical RAM in it, which means I can actually load the entire Kali database into memory, and it's very fast, and I can actually get work done. So, um, so that's good, because our database is huge. Um, so so that's, that was a, a sort of alternative uh, for that. So and I'm going to kind of skip over uh, some of this, because I know we're, we're a little tight on time here. but. Um, so this was, uh, it's a research project. I mean, the hardware is, uh, does anybody, re if anybody wants to talk about the hardware, see me after the, after the thing, I can uh, tell you about that. It runs Linux, and almost everything, I had to learn Python. Uh, I'm learning Python, I should say. Hey, it's not Perl, I can tell you that. <laughs> and the, um, because almost all of this work is being done in Python. Um, in terms of the, especially in the in the uh, in the uh, open source space, um, because uh, we're going to skip that one and cover most of that. So, so one of the things is is that you know, as mentioned, there's a huge economic barrier to doing a lot of this work. It just costs a ton of money, um, you know. And so, if you want to do anything. Um, you know, you start looking at the open source stuff, right? So, uh, Facebook slash Meta did indeed open source briefly some of their, one of their models. Um, they released the weights on that. That got out in the wild. They were like, oh, no, no, not that. But they still make it available to, um, to researchers. So, I uh, dusted off. I, ha I actually have a, uh, an Emory, law, uh, an Emory uh, I, you know, technically affiliated with Emory Law School. So I have an email address for Emory. So after my Cali address didn't work because we don't know what Cali is, I sent them my Emory address. And so now they're very excited that somebody at Emory is doing research on large language models. But you know, hey. So so I've uh, you know I, I was able to get that. But there's a growing open source community <coughs> where people are out there and, and they want to be able to make these models work, uh, you know, sort of for people. Right? They, want, they don't, they don't want to have to pay millions of dollars. And it isn't just the hardware cost, right? I mean, the, um, you know, you have to, you, you know, open the uh, open AI APIs aren't free. I mean, they, you know, you have to buy tokens and there's different levels. And, you know, access to the, to the newest stuff is even more expensive. And there's a bunch of companies like that that are they're doing that sort of stuff. So there's a lot of work where people are taking some of the smaller and, and the older models language models. And they're sort of essentially scaling them down to run on commodity software, or commodity hardware, rather. 
and um, or working with pre-trained models that are that are available. So you don't need to you don't need to rebuild the model. You just take somebody else's model and you do things to it. Um, and and so there's a there's a there's a bunch of work being done in that um, in that space, and it's and it's really interesting, right? I mean, a lot of it's happening in um, in the game. Uh, you know, in the game space, because um, you know you can get some good role-playing stuff out of some of these models and and different things. But people are also looking at it for civic applications or for kind of small businessy sorts of things, right? So in that space, um, Hugging Face is the is the awesome <coughs> company that um, that is running. Uh, uh, that, that actually uh, that actually runs a bunch of this stuff, right? So, right now, back home, and I, and I can't get to it because they, 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 they've got, I think they've got port blockers here in the building, so I can't use the odd port that I have to get at it. But there's actually, I've got a model running in my house, um, and uh, uh, and it's and and this is the particular model that's running, right? So it's all based. At the end of the day, it all comes back down to the llama model from. Uh, that came out of Facebook, right? Um, and 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 uh, and so you know you can go to Hugging Face and you can download these models and you can do different things with them and you get all the licensing information. It's sort of like GitHub for you know large language models. So there's a lot of interesting stuff here. But I've got that um, I've got that going, and then. Um, and then the front end that I run is actually from is the, the uh, text generation web UI, which gives you like this really great front end, and you can load different models and um, and then and then do different kinds of uh, things, including an uh, opening uh, enabling an API that's that works just like the Open Open AI API. So instead of having to pay Open AI. You can run your own smaller model, and a lot of these will also run on CPU, as well as the graphics cards. So the fact that I've got, you know, a giant size CPU and a lot of physical memory in that machine, combined with that video card, means I can run relatively large models. And then, so at this point, I had actually asked the I had asked my model to generate some slides about AI and legal education, just randomly without any, like giving it any context or anything, just like, hey, how you doing? And, um, and this is what we, and this is what we got. This is its title, AI and legal education. Well, that's what I asked it to do. But then after this, it sort of went on its own. So it created an introduction. But I'm not going to read these, but I'll leave them up long enough so people can see them. But you get an idea that like some of it is like, you know, it, it, so, it, like, it doesn't sound bad, right? Like, hey, this, you know, it's like kind of like some of John's stuff this morning, right? It's a little buzzy, but, you know, it, it kind of it kind of gets the, the point across. But notice it does mention the ethical implications and privacy concerns are in there, right? So, uh, you know, uh, and, and it did that without any, uh, without any particular prompting. Um, and then for, whoops, wrong one. Um, and then, you know, and then here, you know, it, it, it hits some of the high points of what you, you know, it, it, that makes sense, right? It's not, um, you know, it's not super strange. Um, the challenge is, and again, you know, working it into the existing, existing curriculum, I thought was, you know, was a really good, that was a good touch. Um, you know, so as far as like guessing what words are coming next, it's doing a pretty good job. Um, examples are interesting because it talks about an AI for contract analysis at Harvard and, um, and the implementation of, of predictive analytics to improve student performance at Stanford. I'm not exactly sure that either one of those things are actually true. I didn't really look. But, but, but I'm, I'm, you know, the, uh, I wouldn't be surprised about the contract analysis thing at Harvard, but maybe in the business school, not the law school. And I'm not sure that Stanford is, uh, uh, you know, uh, sort of trying to control their students by using predictive AI analytics to uh, figure out what they're going to do next, because that doesn't sound quite right. But <laughs> there you go. 
uh, and then uh, and then for uh, for the future, it's just you know personalized learning experiences. Who would like a personalized learning experience? Um, who wouldn't like a personalized learning? Experience? And then um, and then after that, it was just it was pretty much done. Um, and then that was uh, that was that, right? So. The big thing then is is what 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 we might do with this, right? So what might Cali do? Because I'm not committing to anything, because it's very early, right? But one of the things, I mean, they're good at text comparison, right? So um, so Cali lessons have some lessons have short answers of varying lengths, and essay questions. There is a theory that says you could use, you could give an essay exam with the Cali lesson, but we don't necessarily recommend it. But it'd work. Um, so right now, those aren't graded, right? Because there's no way for us to to match any kind of student text other than it, like you know, make sure that the words you know, plaintiff, defendant, and liability are somewhere in the sentence, right? We could do that, but that that doesn't really help anything, right? Um, so, uh, but what this text comparison sort of tool would do would be the author of the lesson, usually law faculty, would, would write a good and cogent model answer, right? And and we'll deal with how that would happen another day. But um, the uh, and then the student would write their answer, and then the the you know the the, the language model would the AI would compare them on the back end, right? So so it'd look at it'd take the model answer, it'd compare the student answer, and it'd say. You know, you got, you know, you, you hit these points, you missed this point, you know, you could have done this, you know, maybe it would have been more clear if you said this sort of stuff. That should work, right? Um, since they're really good at hallucinating, um, <laughs> why not generate hypotheticals? Actually, with a little bit of, you know, with a little bit of, uh, with a little bit of sort of, uh, uh, you know, prompt engineering, um, you can get it to do pretty decent hypotheticals, right? Because it doesn't, you know, uh, uh, and then of course, you know, you wouldn't obviously wouldn't run those on your students untest, you know, unreviewed certainly. Uh, you know, go here, click here twice, grab whatever hypothetical comes up and answer it, and that's only half your grade. So the, uh, <laughs> yeah, don't do that. But but they could provide some things that essentially would work as as prompts to the, you know help you out trying to come up with, um, you know, with hypotheticals for, you know, given, uh, given area. Um, and then also, f uh, faculty tools for, um, for selecting and suggesting uh, course materials, right? I mean, you know, we've got access to a lot of stuff. And, um, you know, one of the things that we've, we've tried to build at various points over the years and, and that have never have, uh, fully succeeded is like sort of something where a faculty member can sit down and need, you know, I need this case that, that talks about this and I want to just pull in these parts and then I need some, I need a law review article that reinforces this and, and you know, and some stuff like that. And, oh, and by the way, make sure the law is all still good, right? So, so we could get closer to that with, um, with something like this, I think. That's what I'm hoping. Um, yeah, so. This is the last slide, and then we'll, we'll take some questions. We're going to run a tad bit long, but that's okay. Um, it's unreliable, which, you know, reliability? No, not really. Speed can be an issue, right? Sometimes ChatGPT isn't there, or it's super slow, or, you know, various things. And, and um, you know, and, and even Pablo mentioned that, you know, this morning, with working with GPT-4, that sometimes they run into kind of performance issues, right? These things take time, and, um, and, uh, and, and I can tell they can take time because the fans run really fast. And so you know, there's something going on. Something when I sit down and think my head gets warm, right? So, um, so, so that's, you know, all that's happening there. And, and that's actually one of the challenges being faced by the open source community is they look at how to sort of make this more available is how fast the, the models can run you know, as you sort of scale down the hardware that they run on. Um, but the hardware that they're running on is getting better every day, too. And then there's the whole cost. I mean, it is, um, you know, if we were out and I wanted to put this together and just sort of work on it, you know, 
using uh, commercially available stuff, we couldn't afford it. Right? It, this this would be one of those things where it'd be like, yeah, it'd be nice, but not everybody can have a Ferrari. So, you know, but um, on the other hand, you can get those really nice Ferrari-looking kits and put them on the frame of an old Volkswagen, right? And who knows, except the guys on Reddit, right? <laughs> yeah, life pro, tri pro tip, don't ever put a, a fake Ferrari kit car on, on R Spotted on, on Reddit and say, is this far Ferrari real? Yeah, because they get it. Um, and uh, yeah, so so that's it. It's the you know those are sort of my well, I shouldn't say final impressions because it's it's everything's changing really fast still, right? I mean, there's a whole uh, you know new models are coming out like brand new models because they can build them so much faster, right? I mean the the um, there was a new version of I forget which one it was. But like the, the its predecessor took like a couple of months, and they they uh, this they, they ran this one up with more parameters like sixty five billion parameters, and it only took them like ten days. So uh, so so the hardware is getting you know is is getting is getting going, and you know uh, and and the predictions on when that sort of slows down is like oh yeah it's going to be a few years yet before the you know before that goes so. All right. Um, any questions? Then we're, we're running long. And, yes. An easy one on the keyboard. Okay. Edge. Sure. Will the slides be made available? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. There we are. Oh. oh, they'll be on the conference website. The conference website. Yeah, um, they'll be attached to the session description on the conference website. Thank you. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So the question of John. Um, it, it seems like. Uh, a lot of the, the suggestions that you raise and the, the issues you flagged require faculty across the board to get up to speed on a lot of this. Um, how do we do that? So at NSU, we actually have our first training scheduled for August. Um, and we're doing, a, and this actually didn't come from me, um, the adjunct who teaches e-discovery for us came to the associate dean and said, the Florida bar is insisting that everybody understand these tools, and my students don't, which means probably the faculty doesn't. And so I leveraged his enthusiasm to become our first training. Everybody has said yes to doing it. And importantly, we're doing it for adjuncts as well as full-time faculty, because of course it affects both populations. Um, you know, we're hearing bits and pieces of that elsewhere. Hopefully everybody here will take that back to their schools and then SEALs and AALS to start reinforcing. You know, every faculty member is dealing with how do you deal with this tool in your classroom. So whether they're a technophile or technophobe, they have to know what's going on. So John, follow up on that same thing. How do you define competence in One this area? Competence, yeah, mean? what would you? So I'm, I'm thinking of the rubric, right? I, I need to I need to write the rubric to test whether these students who are graduating have the competence that the ABA rule requires. What am I going to say competence looks like? So those graduates. Like, novel question. So this is a brainstorming answer. Yes. But a lawyer's competence is to understand the implications of the tool, right? So because right, our job is to protect our clients. It's not necessary. We're, we're not going to be Python programmers. This, I'm, I'm not channeling Dan Katz and suggesting we need to all start to program and build our models or our uh, games at home. But at a minimum, we have to know when our clients are violating privacy and client communications. At a minimum, if our clients have trade secrets, we have to know how to protect those trade secrets. Right? That's, that's basic confidence. As a billing attorney, Right. So there was an example from last week where a paralegal school gave uh, the chat GPT to half of the students, told the other half they couldn't use it. The paralegals who used it found that the tool missed significant components of the contract assignment that they were drafting. Fixing it took them on average 15 minutes less in a one hour assignment than the students who didn't have the tool and wrote from scratch. So I think we're going to very quickly see that not having the ability to make yourself efficient 
is going to become a job competence. But that's going to be 12, 24 months from now. So 24 months from now, they're going to have to know how to use prompts. They're going to have to know how to edit. My existential fear is that it's a great tool for experts to make us efficient. And for novices who don't know what's a hallucination and what's a fact, it's a really dangerous implement. And so we're going to have to teach students that. To me, that's the, that's the starting point for confidence. Anyone else? Yes. Interesting question tonight. It has a technical side and a philosophical side. Um, and obviously, uh, you know, Elmer, you took the time to sort of study a little bit of hardware. You understand sort of how to put together how the chips are affecting ability to process. Um, you're talking about this idea of training um, young lawyers, but in this case, students who will then become young lawyers, at least theoretically, uh, you know, on uh, whatever scales of uh, cases or whatever they need to study to be prepared to, of course, analytically skilled. But let's just say that all those people are annihilated. Let's just say it. No, no, literally, it's, it's a double job position. How do the people who are not annihilated know how to manage the machines? That's the question I'm asking. And I mean annihilated, destroyed. I mean annihilated like their jobs are removed. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> pause for a little extra long on that one. Well, the machines manage that, themselves. I think all been, there's bigger problems if you've all been annihilated. No, so, so, so from, the, from the technical side, I mean, the, 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 I think that's the thing that, that the technical folks have had to wrestle with forever, right? Which is, you know, whenever there's turnover, in the tech space, there's a significant amount of relearning of whatever it is, right? Because, you know, uh, somebody's going to come in uh, eventually and, and replace me because I'll sooner or later I'll retire. Yeah, sooner or later I'll retire, and um, you know I, I will. Yeah, I know. <laughs> but the, 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 I think that I think that the. Um, I don't know. I, I don't have. I don't. I never have a really good answer for that question because every time I've left a job in the past, um, you know, looking in six months later, only sees that like all the tech that I had in place is gone, right? It's been replaced with something else, right? And um, uh, and, and nobody asked me. They just you know they just tore it up and moved on. So I'm not sure that the the notion of um, it's more of a uh, it's more of a, it's, well, it's not really an evolution, because I'm, I'm pretty sure that a bunch of times they were taking steps backwards, I would like to say that. But the, um, but, uh, but you know, stuff does change over time, and then I think as, as people get replaced, or they're not there anymore. Like, if I stop doing this, um, you know, uh, I'm not sure that anybody would, uh, in, you know, in sort of the, the, the space, I don't know, is anybody else? actually playing with the models themselves directly? <clears throat> right, a few people, right? So um, has anybody actually run one locally on, you know, on anything? Yeah, I mean, the, the, um, you know, so, uh, so, so, so I think that, that like if I was annihilated like right now, I don't know, the, um, you know, I, I think nothing would happen, you know, which is, I guess, maybe sounds a little sad, but <laughs> at least for the moment anyway. Yeah, it's, it's kind of a Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, right? The B ship went off, and right, that's what ended the universe. Uh, but I think philosophically, we're going to see an evolution, right? And so whether that happens across industry or in a firm, there is going to emerge that expert in, answer, right, in how to prompt, how to shape the best prompts to get the best answers out. That person may end up working in the firm law library. If, those, you know, if we reemerge information services at law firms, we may create a new subspecialty. <coughs> Probably don't need to be a lawyer. So I would actually expect that that's going to come out of paralegal programs and master schools rather than law school. And those prompt experts are going to replace expensive law students um, and junior lawyers and add profit margins to the firms. And so we're going to so disrupt the definition of what the job is 
that that category can disappear and the jobs will reemerge in different boxes and different buckets. Else? Well, the way the way that problem gets solved usually in big software projects is code documentation, right? So that raises the question: Do these things document their code? Does what you're playing with actually create the guide that the next guy or gal can, or pardon me, I mean be gender, nope, um, can access to understand it? So yes and no. I mean, they, you can, for example, you can get them to explain themselves. And certainly the, the sort of documentation that goes with, like most of how all of these models have been built is, in, uh, are in, is uh, documented in scholarly articles, right? So, you know, half the stuff I read is, is you know, it's just pulling out of X archive, right? So it's just, um, so it's all there. And, and a lot of it is weirdly easy to follow. Right, like once you sort of, you know, decide how much math you want to absorb, and um, uh, but some of it is self-referential. It's not really good documentation. The the site like uh, Hugging Face actually they encourage really good and deep documentation on the things that people put there, so that folks can replicate. Um, and uh, you know, and certainly open source projects. Um, are all over the board on where um, you know where documentation fits in, but we like to have as much documentation as we can. And that said, it's much more fun to program than write the documents about the programming. So <laughs> that often happens. Um, yeah. And these things are creating their own layers as they learn, right? They are creating their so own layers. They and it's not, how that worked? No. Right. And that's all that's the part. Box. Yeah. Uh, at some point, it eventually becomes a black box. Right. Like you know where it started because it started from some seed algorithm that they gave it, right? And you know what you end up with at the end, which is this giant model. What's actually happening and the iterations that they're going through is indeed locked inside whatever's going on inside the model. You're not doing it, and it's not doing it. So the answer is nobody. Nobody. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> and the data sets proprietary, and and it's the, the proprietary data sets that are a big problem because that actually stands in the way of anybody figuring it out, right? right. And the um, uh, and so some of the stuff that's being done in the open source space is essentially poking at it, that stuff that is open source and available, and poking at these models to see what they do when I do this, to try and figure out. Essentially, a reverse engineering sort of thing, yeah. you know. And some of them are too big to do that, too. At least, at least in an open source sense of like, you know, uh, you know, who's paying for all this? Yeah. And there's a lot of money, but that's okay because it's all based in crypto. So I think it'll be okay. <laughs> <laughs> too many of these guys. So too many of these open AI guys came from the crypto world. <laughs> Well, because they're using the same, a lot of the same technologies, right? The, those video cards. One of the reasons why I could build something for ten thousand dollars that would be relatively stunning is because I can buy up half of an old crypto farm, right? They don't need anymore, and um, uh, it's the same. It, the, the, those are the same video cards. So you can get them on eBay. Well, there's yeah, there's. <laughs> There's, there's, there's sources for that stuff. But yeah, I mean, okay. uh, anybody else? And we ran, we ran a bit long, right? Thank you.